The views and opinions expressed on any programme are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the programme and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of FRC Media, Bristol Community College or the City of Fall River. And I'm CJ. And it is Monday in a rib after a weekend of <laughs> of, uh, of protests and fun. <laughs> quarantines and government interventions. So, uh, yeah, I guess we had a protest in front of uh, in front of government center. Yes, we did. There was several, and there was several people there. It wasn't a small little protest. I mean, there was probably fifteen or twenty people there, and. Um, they're all protesting the fact that, you know, the economy is shut down, the restaurants, the stores, and, and they want to go back to work. And that's what they're arguing for. Now, what's interesting is they said, you know, there were signs out there. Some said, you know, let, let the healthy go to work. Uh, some signs were really, I think, just wrong, where they said, leave the elderly in quarantine, leave the sick in quarantine. I'm like, that's just wrong. <laughs> tries to kill off the elderly. You know, once you hit a certain age, they don't even want to give you medical care. And we discussed that on those uh, those guidelines of triage on, on yeah. a previous show, which to me is ridiculous. So you're going to save some some uh, some 28-year-old junkie and give him the ventilator when he's probably in worse physical condition than some 85-year-old. True. Because if he's 85, you're going to kill him. Right. You know, so. Right. Well, one of the... Um... Uh, I'm, I can't, I'm, I'm missing the word here. One of the organizers, there it is. One of the organizers was Sarah Rabello. And her big complaint is that number one, she's not working. And um, I know that she works in the food service industry. And number two, her tenants aren't paying their rent. And she has mortgage payments to make. And, you know, I, I agree with her in, in a great respect. These people think that they're not going to pay their rent or have to pay their rent. When this gets over and they're talking about possibly taking all of, all out of quarantine in May now because we're going down the slope according to the governor at his last press conference yesterday. Uh, he's still looking for numbers, but he's saying it's a good sign that we're starting to go down the slope. Uh, that Those rents are going to become due. So far, it's only one month. But what happens if we had gone three months or four months and that rent comes due? You don't have the money to pay that rent, you're evicted. Because landlords have waited four months for it or three months for it, and they're gonna say, I'm not gonna wait an extra month. You've had all this time to put that money together. Plus, if you're collecting unemployment, you're not gonna tell me you can't afford to pay your rent. Because some people are making more money on unemployment than they ever made in their life in their job. When you're considering that they're getting the unemployment amount plus $600. So don't even, don't even get me going on that one. There are a lot of people who are questioning that, you know, they're, 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 there's a lot of overcompensation because it's an election year, in my opinion. Well, that may might be it. Let, it. They may be altruistic, but it's hard for me to believe, oh, that's yes, the time. Good time for coffee. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, they, they, you, you could try to convince me it's altruistic. I don't believe the government's ever altruistic. I think all they have to do is worry about their political positions. It's an election year. We know about this overcompensation. We're giving, we're giving, uh, you know, six hundred dollars more. As you said, there are people making twice what they ever made, you know, when they were working. And I don't know what the impetus is for them. The impetus is for them to go back to work. It's just like people on welfare. You know, they don't want to go to work because if they get a minimum wage job, they're doing worse. They're working because not right. everybody pay for that health care and everything else. So, I mean, you know, the country went so far out of whack, and now they're going to give these giant bonuses to everybody in these in these uh, health care industry. And you know as well as I do, CJ, I mean, I think you're the, the guy to really answer this theoretical. I mean, look, when you became a nurse, you knew your job was to deal with public health. Correct. Obviously, it's a public health emergency. What you're doing is, yeah, granted, it's a terrible thing. You're working like a, you're working your butt off, but that's what you signed on to do in the first place. Correct. 
Correct. It's like me and Fire Fight is extra because they get biased. It's like really? But that's what but that's what they're talking about right now. They're talking about having hazard pay for nurses and doctors, and they're also talking about having that same hazard pay for fire police and EMS. Well, Am I against that extra pay? Not necessarily, but you knew what you were doing when you signed on for the job. Yeah, well, look, I hate to say this, but you know, I, you know, I, I try to be, to try to be, hey, there's Bentley, good shot at Bentley today. Oh. <laughs> Consider the fact that they got a $1,200 stimulus check and not everyone has gotten it. As a matter of fact, the federal government announced today that mail out checks are starting to go out sometime today. So you should be getting your check in a couple of days if you're expecting a mail, a check mailed to you. Um, but with a $1,200 stimulus check plus $600 a week in unemployment, and that you get that for four months, you've got no excuse why you can't pay your rent. You're not going to tell me that that eighteen hundred dollars that you got from the, the from unemployment and the twelve hundred from the federal government couldn't pay your rent. You're not going to tell me that you spent so much money on food that it, you couldn't pay your rent because how were you doing it before? You were paying your rent before with no problem. So there's no excuse for not paying your rent. There's no excuse for not paying your electric bill. There's no excuse for not paying your gas bill. I mean, it's amazing how people who can't pay their electric or the gas bill has enough money to fill up the gas tank in their car. So it, I, I never can understand the people's, uh, you know, motivations here. I really don't. Well, you know, it's, look, that's because they, they think everybody's dumb. They can't figure this out. As you said, if you get $600 more, now look, if somebody hasn't gotten their check yet, if, they, if their unemployment hasn't been processed, if they're, well, you know, you could, you know, if you tell your landlord, look, it's in the process, I filed the claim. And then there are some people that haven't gotten it yet. But True. It is very clear that this stuff is retroactive. True. True. And it is retroactive. So, I mean, they may get a huge check, like 2400 or more. So yeah. they, there's no excuse why they can't pay their bills. Yeah. All right. And I have to back to one other thing on you, because I know you were, you were a nurse and you were actually a practicing nurse for a long time. And I know that. During your career, 
in nursing. You must have had some horrific uh, nights and days where you got whatever, uh, and you you guys were under the gun and got and, and granted, it's not a continuous continuous uh, barrage like we have today with it. You know, it, it's but you have really bad days. Nobody ever offered you a bonus because you knew what you signed on for. And the thing is, look. While I sympathize with their workload, uh, you know, uh, it is what it is, and uh, and they should get good money. If they don't get good money already, well, maybe this is a thing, but to get, like, bonuses, because every time we have a, a, a emergency incident, a mag, uh, you know, that means that Police officers and firefighters be getting bonuses every time they they have a they have a run basically because it's always ninety eight percent of them are emergency situations. So, I mean, there's going to be it seems like the country's out of control with this thing. It, it, it's either an overreaction in either direction. We saw that demonstration where you said, you know, you know, quarantine all the old people and the sick people and let us do what we want. So it, it's 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 become. We've gone from the ridiculous to the sublime on this. I, I hate to say it, but we're... Well, you know, it's 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 very interesting because uh, I know of I know of a nurse. Uh, she was on Channel Ten. I think I spoke about this in a previous show. Who took a job in New York for ten thousand dollars a week, paid for with federal money, and she did nothing for like the first week she was there, and. She says, I'm going to take another three weeks. I don't blame her. For $30,000 for three weeks? Heck, if they asked me to go, I'd go tomorrow. You want to see me on the Middle City Straight Talk for a while? But, <laughs> you know, I, for $30,000, you can do without me for three weeks. <laughs> yeah, and I don't blame you. Like I said, I don't blame them for taking it. I'm, I'm not saying that. But, I, you know, we're going to talk about the, the debt. And there are people, and, you know, you know, we both know Sarah. You know, we, we have a lot of fun with Sarah. Uh, she speaks her mind. And whether we agree or disagree, we always, you know, we always have some fun. And we can, we've had some very lively discussions with Sarah. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, she was up there. And it's true. People are not, you know, people aren't paying their rent. People are taking advantage of situations. And it's just not right. We have... You know, the, the only thing is that the the average person, the average person, um, is is the one who ends up getting getting screwed in the end because you know big businesses will always get bailed out. You know there'll be there'll be stimulus stuff for businesses, but the, the worker at the end. Let's see what happens. I'm not talking about the scam artists like you said who are getting more money now and then trying to use this as an excuse not to pay the bills. But the people who work as in the food service industry who will not get their job at the end of this at the end of this tragedy, uh, because restaurants are no longer going to be able to have the seating capacity for a very long time. If 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 it's not forever, they're going to have to cut down on the number of tables and the way they serve and the way they serve people. The same thing with buffets. I don't know if there'll, there'll ever be another buffet. Because what are they going to do now with buffets, like in the in the, uh, in the casinos and and in uh, you know in Vegas or anywhere? They're going to have to have people at every station serving people. They're not going to let you stick your hands and you know like grab grab the utensils and serve yourself and put the put the spoon or or, or the or, or the tongs back and let the next guy grab the tongs and, and right and and also. The seating in these buffets, they're pretty cool seating. If you go to, if you ever been to a, a buffet in Las Vegas, the tables are pretty close together. They, they've got a lot of people in those buffets. So that's no longer going to be. So the seating capacity is going to be down. They're going to have to employ more people if they want to serve a buffet. And But a lot of people in regular restaurants are not going to get rehired because if a place used to seat 200 people in the dining room, and now they're down to a hundred. Look, you don't need as many waiters and waitresses and and and, and bus boys and, and whatever. So uh, this is going to have a lot of unanticipated effect on on the working people. And I'm not 
Yeshua. And forgive me if I'm if I'm 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 not an optimist. And I'm also not a, a pessimist. I think I'm a pragmatist. But I don't believe that those people will be taken care of sufficiently. I know big. I know business will be taken care of sufficiently, but there's going to be a lot of people that don't get their jobs back. And I don't think people are facing, a lot of people are facing that back. That's true. And, you know, that's going to be a very interesting scenario when it happens, because you're right. Some of these restaurants may actually have their seating capacity cut by half. And if that's the case, and you had 10 waitresses before, you may only have five now. We may even have less than five. So what do you do? What, what, you know, how do you handle it? Because there will be some people who are not going to get their jobs back if that is the case. The same situation is going to apply in the school systems. During the weekend flush, I talked tremendously. I, I mean, I gave it a whole page and a half about the school system and Rebecca Cusack and her con conversation with Alan Zarek over at WSAR. And the fact that they're looking at, because they're in negotiations for their contract right now, which all the city unions are in negotiations with the contract. So one of the things that Rebecca Cusick has to look at is what happens if remote learning becomes the norm? What happens if they start back to school with social distancing? What do they have to do and have to continue in with their contract? Because these teachers have to understand it as well. Because how does a teacher teach the course if the teacher has to maintain six feet away from the student? How does the teacher go over and help out the student? Now, what about if we have to all wear masks again and we have to keep wearing the mask after all of this is done? How do kids go to school and use a mask? Because, I mean, especially kids with special needs who may be deaf, they read lips, they can't read the lips over with a mask. So it's going to be interesting to see how the school systems deal with this. The biggest issue they're going to have is, and I, I think that Fall River is going to have the bigger issue with it. And I think that our school committee, if you're listening, school committee, stop listening. I think they're going to have to look at the fact that if they have to social distance in these schools, there's no way they're going to be able to maintain the classrooms at 30 to 35 students. They're going to have to drop them to 15 to 20 students, if that. And how are they going to do that in the school system? They barely have enough classroom space now for everything they're using. And that's going to result in an increase in teachers that they're going to need. And it's going to result in an increased need of classrooms. So are we going to go back to renting trailers for, for classrooms? I mean, I remember when we used to do that. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how they handle that. And maybe what they'll have to do is get some of these administrators off their backsides and send them to work teaching again. I don't know if they'll like that, but that's a possibility. And I think the school committee and the unions need to look at this seriously. Another factor is that this is not, we have these press conferences every day and a 24 hour news cycle and everything is just a, you know, and they, there's, there's an, I just saw somebody on, I believe it was Channel 10, uh, somebody who is in charge of the New Bedford, I guess, version of Star, who was complaining that the medical personnel keep changing. Uh, what they want people to do uh, because about testing and this and that. Will this work and that work? So she was kind of complaining about all the changes in the information. And but the reality is that's one of the, the that's one of the problems with constantly demanding uh, that you get updates. And you know we get Gina every Saturday, every afternoon, and we got Charlie every afternoon, and we got. We got Trump every every late afternoon, and they're on there giving us information, and the information changed from the day before because the medical professionals keep saying we don't have enough data, we don't have enough. So it's you know we're going to be getting we're going to be getting uh, information about this virus for years after this because you need Truly. data to really to really get this. And I think CJ would take this opportunity to utilize your your background, because I, I've i spoken to a few people, and it was mentioned on on TV the other day, and people are totally like they were baffled, because they think that this is like a, it's a new, it's a new variation, it's a new strain, but I guess somebody mentioned the fact that the common cold is a coronavirus. It is. 
They think the coronavirus is like something new. There's never been a corona. This is a different strain. But can you want to give people a fundamental, like, uh, a, a in English explanation of that? This is not like some new disease. It's just a variation of something that's been around. So. Well, very simply, you know how you're able to get the cold every year. Sometimes you get it twice a year or three times a year. That's because the virus, which is the cold, which is a coronavirus, mutates and it changes. Now, what's going on with this coronavirus, COVID-19? And COVID-19 doesn't mean it's the 19th coronavirus. It means COVID-2019. That's what was first found in November of 2019. This And even this virus they're now saying is, is mutating. So we have to look at that possibility that this is not mutating. So it's never really going to go away. But this COVID-19 that we have is a form of the coronavirus that's a little stronger or a little bit different in its effect on the body than a cold is. With a cold, you get the runny nose, the cough, the, the head cold, the congestion. With coronavirus, you get a lot of the same things. You get the head cold, you get the, the stuffiness, the sniffles. Uh, sometimes you get the cough, you get a sore throat, you get body aches. All of those things are the same that are in a coronavirus but they're also the same that's in a flu. Now, the reality of the matter is the flu kills more people in a year than the coronavirus does, than COVID-19 does. But it's the the infection rate. The coronavirus, COVID-19 infection rate is very high. It's easily transmittable, just like the common cold. So we have to look at that. Now, what you're looking at again is like an apple, which becomes an orange. And that's basically what you're looking at. It's not possible, you think, but it is. So remember, all this is is a, is a coronavirus that's a, a, able to change. And we're looking at the possibility that right now it is changing. They're saying that there are different strains of COVID-19 across the country based upon where they're located. So that's an interesting fact that we're now just starting to see. So that should be very interesting to see how that pans out. I'm looking for the research. Yeah, you're right. And that research will take time and and, and data accumulation. And the other thing that I think that this really highlighted, which a lot of people aren't even talking about yet, is it's easily spread. But we find out in today's society how easy it is to actually spread this internationally because of all the international business, international travel. And we see that the way people are highly mobile. In the old days, you know, they lived in a little house on a prairie and there was nobody around, you know, for miles. It wasn't going to, it's like looking at the COVID-19 virus in, in Wyoming or Montana that are very sparsely populated. You don't see right. the numbers that you see here. But what we've seen here is something that a dynamic that I don't think anybody's really discussed yet. How a any disease, not just this one, but we've seen how easy it is if a disease crops up, how easy it is to spread everywhere because people are people can get on the airplane, go to anywhere in the world, they get on planes, trains, buses, uh you know, uh motor vehicles, they go visit their cousins out in Iowa or something like that, build it, and they shall come or spread it, and they will get it. That was pretty good. I like like that one, spread it, (laughs) and they will get it. But, uh, you know, people have a lot of mobility in today's society, and and this is the reason. And then, of course, when it spreads to areas that are very densely populated, like the state of Massachusetts, New York City, the state of New York, California, it has extremely densely populated cities. We're seeing one of the problems, because I'm going to tell you, uh, I don't believe that this problem is is unique to COVID-19. I think that we've seen a, an area in our society that that it shows us something that there could be some other disease that could do the same thing because of the way we live today. Because today... You know, in the old days, you took a boat over here, and if you made it to the United America, you know, you went out west and 
settled the West, and it didn't spread. But today, people can get anywhere and spread it everywhere. In a matter of hours. Right. In a matter of hours. It's interesting. Well, one of the things, uh, as you were talking, and I, I was listening to you, um, I, I found this in uh, the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, why does COVID-19 cause serious illness or kill some patients and leave others with mild or no symptoms? Infectious disease specialists in the Bay Area and across the country who are studying this phenomena believe. You'll notice they don't say it's occurring this way. They believe the immune system of some adults, including young and otherwise healthy people, overreact to the presence of the virus. There is something about the virus that apparently confuses the body into attacking healthy cells, along with the virus compromised cells. The out of control inflammatory reaction, which specialists call uh, cytokine storm syndrome, can damage the lungs, heart, and other organs. So it's interesting to see that. And one of the things that they're talking about here, and the reason why they're talking about this is because they're talking about the mutations of this disease. And, uh, you know, the New York Post posted five days ago, the coronavirus has mutated into at least 30 different strains. Chinese studies find. How much, how much confidence can you put in the Chinese studies? I don't know. But, you know, very much. I, exactly. Um, but we are seeing different strains in the United States, depending on where you are. So it's, and, and that's one of the questions that is the big question is if the virus does indeed mutate this way, is the virus going to be any, is the vaccine going to be any good towards this virus? And that's, that's a very good question and a serious question to ask. No, you're right. And, and, you know, unfortunately what they don't talk about too is this is a, this, you know, we're having this problem because let's face it, Medical science today has basically allowed us to circumvent the basic laws of nature, or as as uh, Darwin talked about the uh, the survival of the fittest, the, the natural selection, and because today's medical science allows people to live with conditions that years ago. Would, be, would have been terminal. Uh, you know, when we settled the United States in the, in, the, in the 17 and 1800s, I think the lifespan was in the 40s. People didn't live long. They died from diseases which have fundamentally been eradicated by medications. So, see, nature has a way of culling the herd. So the weak, the weak animals do not survive. The strong animals survive. If you study anything about evolution, whether you believe it or not, it's true. Because there's a little thing called fossils that prove it's true. And evolution is fundamentally an adaptation of the species. Giraffes didn't always have long necks. What happened was the giraffes with longer necks could get to the leaves that the, the, the giraffes with shorter necks couldn't get. And uh, those, those giraffes died off. So they evolved into creatures with extremely long necks. And they are they are fossils of of, uh, of giraffes with uh, shorter necks, and you can also see evolution in many species, and in even humans adaptations like sickle cell anemia, thalassemia anemia, pain uh, sac disease are all are, are all prevalent in areas where there are malaria. And if you get these genes, it gives you a little bit of anemia, but it also gives you a, you know, an immunity to malaria. So that's an adaptation. So we see a lot of people dying in nursing homes. And the reality was uh, a lot of these people have extremely compromised immune systems or on a ton of medication. And when you get something like this, unfortunately, nature uh, has not prepared them to, to deal with it anymore. So it's, it's a horrible thing, but it, it's, it's just a fact of life. I hear you. I hear you. Well, we're down to our last minute, and uh, I'll tell you about the nursing homes. I didn't like all the medications that I used to see them give, but um, we uh, we hope you enjoyed this show, and we hope to keep coming back to you. I want you all to stay safe.